so good to be back with you on Sunday. If you are not ready to ascend into the high place of the Most High God, I don't know what you're ready to do. Because I'm like, I'm just trying to keep the tears from flowing down from my eyes this morning as they are worshiping the Lord. And we're entering into this time to give God praise and to give him glory for all the great things he has done in our lives and over this week. It's just a privilege and an honor to serve him and to be in his offspring and to be in a part of his congregation this morning. Amen. God is worthy of all the praise. All yes, the he is. Yes, he is. This is going to give us worship. So as you come yes. on in, please uh, uh, come on in and uh, tell us where you're watching from so we can shout out to you. I already have some shout outs to give to, uh, I think it's Jason Righteous. And hey. I like that. I like that spelling for righteous, Jason. And good morning, Sierra Sledge. Hey, PIT Francine Brooks, good how you morning. doing? Good morning. Good morning. It yes, is yes, definitely yes. a good morning. It is God's morning. Come on. And we're so glad to have you all on today to come in with us as we worship and we get to know the Lord a little bit more intimately and more biotically. Come on now, come on. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, we get to know him more biotically. So you guys, if you do not have we hold this this big thing up y'all if you do not have the biotic gospel reference bible this one is actually the old testament so if you do not have this bible you need to get it it is going to connect you biotically which is the living word of god connect you to his living word so you can come on in and be transformed into his image and likeness through the renewing of your mind through the watering of the word okay yes yeah, so some more shout outs here with that yes. uh, kim oliver good morning to good you good morning Ms. uh jajari rivera good morning good, good morning. morning and nicole Grease, come on good girl morning, yes family. good morning good morning, good morning. It is yes, good yes. to see all of you on this morning. So glad to have all of you on. Now, last week we were on when Dr. Price talked about she was going to do a class yes. on the book that she wrote before the garden. Yes. Now, that's something that if you are local, you definitely yes. do not want to miss out on. Now, this is my copy. I brought this about five years ago, <laughs> but I am going to get me another copy for her class so I can do fresh notes. I have all kinds of notes in here from when uh, <laughs> uh, Chief Prophet Tyler was teaching it. I yes. think it took her seven years, you said? Yeah, we went through it a long time, yeah. <laughs> so I have all kind of notes in here from that, but I want to have fresh notes from the author who writes this, yes. <laughs> our Chief Apostle, Dr. Well, Prophet yours Price. looks better than mine. I got <laughs> mine in 2015. Okay. And so mine got all the tabs, got all the mm -hmm. sticky notes, yep. it's got sticky tabs, it's got posted notes, Descriptions and everything, so what was way better than that? <laughs> <laughs> well, you had yours long there, yes. and I'm telling you, even if you don't register for her class, you still want to purchase yes. it if you don't have it because this is a great Bible study tool. One of the yes. first things that she delves into in this book is the difference between eternity, eternal. Yes. You know, we have been taught that those mean the same thing, but they absolutely do not. So, yes. definitely get your uh, copy of this. Um, definitely get this in the bookstore today. Yes, definitely get it in the bookstore, get it online. Yes, you, uh, Amazon, purchase your copy because it's really good. It's like a textbook of God's theology and how it's written in paper so we can really learn it and really assimilate it and become what he wants us to be through his word. Because it started before the garden, exactly. you know, God started in eternity, like you said, mm -hmm. and he's eternal. So you can get all of those definitions and all of that great underbelly story of who Jesus is and how he relates to us and what his purpose was for cre creating us in the garden. So I, it's one of my favorites, one of the ones that I definitely dove in head first and really tried to get a grasp and an understanding as someone who didn't grow up in church, didn't have a lot of understanding of a lot of Bible stories. I didn't understand really a lot of those nuanceful things. And that book really broke the mold and broke it open for my understanding to be able to enter in to what not only my chief apostle is teaching us every Sunday, but also to understand what God is saying to me every day through his word through his prayers through his prophecy and all of those things and how he communicates with us so it's definitely a great read definitely a learning tool definitely a study tool along with size come on with your biotic gospel reference bible come on, come come on, on partner come these on. things together yes, use them together use them and co-parent this with each other so you can really break through we said to, when we were talking a little bit before like this 
stay at your desk. This stay at your secret place when you go into the Lord. This is where this stay. This is your house Bible, you know. And then you get the little one you bring out on the church, you know. And you, and you correlate and you put the stuff in there. But so you need to get it, you guys. Um, it is such an honor to be a part of this congregation to see God show up every week, time and time again. Show up in each one of our lives. I mean. It has been awesome. I have been here officially six years this month. Hey. I know, right? It's been six years already. And it has been a joy. I'm not going to say it's been easy, but it's definitely been worth it. Um, and I marvel at the work and the power that the Lord has done in my life. And he continues to do in this congregation and around all of these people. So we would invite you to come in. If you have not made your way into the house, we want you to come in. It is not too late to join us. It is not too late to be a part of this word today um, and really open up and hear what the Lord has to say. So we invite you in. Of course, continue to watch on Facebook, join in on YouTube, especially Rumble if you need to, and come on in and join us today. Yeah, for me, it's been three years since I came yes. home. And no regrets, absolutely no yes. regrets. And just, just seeing the change and the growth um, mm -hmm that I have been able to have since I left. You know, the teaching that we get here, you know, you all know we can't get this anywhere else. No one else is teaching us. No one else is talking about the biotic gospel. No one is uh, telling us uh, in the scriptures and being able to relate it back to the scriptures. Uh, people, have yes. some, people have some words out there, Definitely. but they can't tie it back to the scriptures, the holy scriptures, okay? Right. <laughs> and give us those answers, you know, why he created us the way he did, how we're living. How are we um, made in his image? What makes us have that access to him in that intimate way? Those are the questions that this living word, because biotic means living. It means alive. It is not a new word. It is not a new doctrine. It is just an adjective and a different adjective for the same word, which is living. And biotic is powerful because it actually comes against that AI agenda and yes. that artificial. Absolutely. So it's just another word, another, so it's not anything new. Just the same word in a different adjective meaning living. And we are the living word of God. You know, we are his living epistles. So that has to be biotic. It has to have a body. It has to be corporeal. And that's exactly what that means. So we invite you all to stay online, to enter in with us as we go into the study room, the library of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning and be transformed by his word and by the teaching that will come from our chief apostle. And biotic is basically giving you the technology behind our theology. And that's why this is a high church. It's not the Christ said on last Sunday. Yes, he did. <laughs> this church is a high church because it gives you the it gives you the technology yes. behind our theology. So that's why you're able to answer the questions. She's able to answer the questions as to why. Because it's giving you God's mind, it's giving you it from God's perspective. Yes. Yes. Uh, which you know it is not popular today. Um, but that is where we need to, this is where his church needs yes. to be, understanding the mind of God and speaking from the mind of God. Yes. So we're so glad. Thank yes. you all Thank you for all. joining us. Yes. Share, share, share. Yes. You haven't already. Share, no share, one. Share, share this share. out. Share it out. You already shared. Share it again. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see you inside. Yes. 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 God bless.
What makes New Era events different? What makes New Era's events different is that it is cerebral. The information that Dr. Price disseminates that she teaches, it's not emotional, it's not sensational. Like, unfortunately, most conferences, they hype you up, but she actually gives you the academic cerebral side of Jesus Christ, where you can consciously process and become what you are hearing. And so that's what makes New Era's events different from others. It's the approach of the gospel or how she presents the gospel. It's academically, it's cerebral, and it provokes thought. Is Jesus where did he come from why did he come why does Christianity still exist today welcome to the biotic gospel the eternal lifespan of Jesus Christ Daniel is a prophet but his book hasn't been written but yet there's a scripture of truth that the gay angel Gabriel brings himself into and brings a portion of to Daniel. And he gets all of these prophecies and all of these um, predictions and, and answers. And it, it is so overwhelming, Daniel passes out. He, he says, and then he has to take three sick days from work because he just cannot go to work. Because what this angel has brought to the planet anatomically, that is the emphasis I want you to listen to. This angel brought the entire future of his people and a good part of the human race and the ages to come, including the church, he brought it anatomically. That is why angels are so instrumental in God's messages. And matter of fact, the book of Hebrews said that the law came through angels. So that automatically brings us out of the text out of the, the written print, out of the visual, even off the mountain where God first etched the Ten Commandments and it brings us into beings, living beings, biological beings, physiological beings, anatomical beings. I, I wanted you to hear that because we have to set the stage to frame it for why the gospel is biotic and why if we don't get back to that, the church will not recover its footing and its grip on the world and the time and future will not show up the way we need. But again, we're moving down the line. I can't wait until we have a biotic gospel movie. That'd be cool. We just need a couple, you know, million dollars to do that but hey when God's in the mood money moves all right let's say our creed and let's say the whole thing with conviction you know how I am about this not just like the last three words ready we are new era apostleship restitution where we disciple apostolic Christians into becoming scripturally organic culturally unmodified Christians at the congregation of the mighty where God stands. Sure. Yes. Come on. We are becoming September 23rd. Anybody need an offering envelope? They're passing those out. September 23rd, 24th is our church anniversary weekend. Do you know when that is? Next weekend. <laughs> That's actually the week, the next weekend we're in is our church anniversary celebration. Yay! Oh, guys, guys, come on. 
I'm just going to presume you're digging out that money because I do see a lot of heads down and hands in wallets and purses. This is the offering, right? Okay. Apostle Holt and Lady A will be in town. So we might be uh, at the table part next. Just part next is where we're going to be at the table. Sunday after service is our potluck lunch. And we'll be uh, reaching out to some of you all to bring some things for that. And then we have our concert evening service at probably like six o'clock because we need time to transition and trying to bring some people in to say some things. Sunday is hard to catch other preachers because, well, we all have churches. <laughs> But um, it will be an evening. So what I'm going to be doing, you will see me running around trying to capture some of you on camera, saying a few words about your church, about Dr. Price. If I do not get to you, you know what I'm going to say? Do not let the spirit of offense settle in. Do not create an imagination in your mind that is not true. I'm telling you right now, whatever your reason is, it's not true because my goal is just to run past people and say some things. Please don't hem me up in the corner. I have something to say, Apostle Ashley. We all do. So, all right. Those videos will be shown and clips will be shown in the evening portion of the night, as well as some special music selections. Like I said, we're trying to snatch some people up from around the city to be a part of this celebration. Uh, we've already will have worked Apostle Holt in the morning, so he'll be uh, just, you know, receiving in the evening with that super excited Saturday is incredible pizza. Yes, you'll receive an email this week with the time for you all to be there and just have an incredible time. Incredible pizza is just fun. We go and we love incredible pizza because we don't have to cook. That's for Sunday after lunch. We don't have to clean up at Incredible Pizza. They pay people to do that. And then everybody can run around and play games and come and go as you please and just socialize. And maybe uh, if you're not a gamer, laugh at other people who are playing games. I mean, it's just fun. It's just a good time to do something enjoyable in this city. So that is next weekend. <laughs> Can't even believe it. Okay. And how can you plug into the congregation of the mighty? How many of you feel like you are plugged in? Okay. If there's anybody who is not, and it's not by your choosing, because I know some people are like, I just want to be here on Sunday and leave me alone the rest of the week and whatever. That's fine. But if you're the people now, I will say that warfare tends to hit you a little harder when you on the fringes. Um, things tend to get through a little easier when you're not fully invested. I'm speaking from observation. This is not some sort of manipulation, guilt trip. I don't even know how people spend things these days to land at witchcraft, but it's none of that. But in my observation, the more on the outskirts you stay, sometimes the more challenging it can be to stay covered. And so we have different ways. We have our handouts in the back of what we believe and teach and also about our congregation. If you also want to know more, how many of you are not sure how to plug in at the congregation of the mighty? You're like, I don't know. Okay. A couple. All right. There's Tammy has her hand up. Can you get the, I can't know. I'm not sure if it's the salmon color or the green one. The one that says about the congregation of the mighty, if you can give that to Tammy over here, anybody else want one to know how to get more plugged in at the church, she, uh, Charnel will give it to her. That's really important to know so you know all of your options. We have tele-discussion groups where you can talk it out on the phone one hour a week, just one hour. Will you not tarry with me one hour? All right. We have Wednesday night midweek service, 90 minutes, 6.30 to 8 o'clock. Midweek is that combination of Bible study, scripture study, breaking down the message, a lot of reviews, games, things can get a little wild on Wednesday night, a lot of camaraderie. There's some amens and laughing people. You know who you are about that but plugging in at the congregation of the mighty you have a lot of options some of it if you want to be in a prayer pod there where you have different clusters of congregational members that pray for each other pray for the ministry and things like that you have options to join there so make sure that you're plugging in that you're staying connected monthly men's meeting first saturday of the month 9 a.m the men meet it used to be a breakfast and things shifted guys 
So now it's a meeting with coffee. Is there coffee? No coffee? Bring your coffee. Bring your coffee. Listen, just show up. Okay, just show up. Bring whatever you want to drink on or, well, that's godly, or snack on. Men's meeting. Hmm. 9 a.m. It's for deliverance. But the men get together in fellowship and uh, do what they do. Okay. And let's get to the money. Yes. Well, all right for the amen for the money. We're starting off the right way. Bless the Lord. The carpeting is installed, as you can see, all the way around. Yes, new carpet, new carpet, new carpet. Right in time for a wedding in, rehearsed in uh, reception next week. Had a big one la yesterday downstairs. Huge, huge, huge reception downstairs. And, uh, and it just keeps on going. So economy is flowing in and not just out. Five ways to give. You can see on your screen. Make your checks payable to C-O-M-E-E. -E, acronym COM, Congregation of the Mighty Ecclesial Embassy. You can text to give. You can PayPal. You can put cash in that basket. You can put a check. You can put a money order. You can wire your tithes and offerings. You can send it in the mail. You can schedule your account to automatically send it in the mail. I'm telling you what people have done and are doing. All the ways you can drop it off at the door here at the Congregation of the Mighty, Monday through Friday, or we can schedule a meeting if you have a special amount, as people have, that you want to deliver. Deliver, 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 deliver. It's the congregation of the mighty choir. Come on. Yes, it's the offering choir. Okay, and now, I don't know why offering, it's, it doesn't have to be serious. All right, so we're going to collect your tithes and offerings and our uh, India is posture to do something. Okay. Hello, I'm Guy Donahue, and this is my wife, Charlotte Donahue. Uh, we've been married nine and a half glorious years, and we've known Dr. Price two years, maybe a little over, and uh, have become very friendly with her and uh, have watched her grow and grow her ministry. So it's been a, a wonderful trip. She amazes us. She and I have had a lot of discussions. Now, I'm, I'm a purveyor of truth of the Bible. And uh, we read, ever since we've been married, we've read through the Bible every year. We read it out loud. One morning I read her, read to her, and the next morning she reads to me. But I've done that for years beforehand and, and have taught for many years. But she amazes me how in depth she goes with the scriptures. And I have questions that I go to her and uh, ask her because I want to hear her viewpoint. I have never asked her a question that she hasn't studied and came up with a very biblical answer. She's very unique. She's very wise. I had a spiritual issue that she helped me with and it was amazing, and I will remember her for that. And I just like her personally. I could almost sit at her feet and listen to her for hours. She's an amazing woman. I don't know anybody that has the study that I am seeing her put forth. She has spent hours digging into the word and you know the the, the bible is multi-layered and she's got into layers that a lot of people are totally unfamiliar with mm -hmm. and i also believe that she has a real passion for preparing the church for the last days mm -hmm. and i believe that her goal is to equip people to hear what God's saying to them about their life. And she likes, she likes to give you information. Dr. Price delights in 
poking you, see where you're at, and really get you to affirm what you believe and maybe need It takes all of it. And Lord, we bless you that we're in a season of prosperity. And so we summon in the fullness of the season. You can praise him. The fullness of the season of prosperity that you are in. We decree that every bronze sky is open unto us. We decree that every closed door that shouldn't be closed is open unto us. Not just as a congregation uh, in house, but also as an institution, as every member here, every member online, those of you who are sewing online. And we decree that the season of prosperity is upon us. Rain Raining down from the heavens, opening up from the doors. The winds of change are blowing and they're blowing over our finances. And we decree now, Lord, that you have blown out barrenness. You have blown out a dead ground. You have blown out a hard ground and a dead sky. And like Elijah, we summon in the rain. We're not happy for the cloud the size of a man's fist over our money, but we summon in the rain of prosperity to rain down that we can't even outrun prosperity not that we would try to outrun prosperity but bless God that we that it will outrun us and chase us down in Jesus name amen are you ready for your drills what is going on in this house today are you ready for your drills come on you have to undergird you got to undergird you got to undergird the move Come on, stay in that. Sustain. Come on. She said, are you ready? Come on, are you ready to decree to the creation? Oh, come on, lift your voices like a trumpet. Are you ready to decree to the world? Yeah, the Dunamites are in the building. The mighty ones have gathered. The miracle workers are here. Come on, lift your voice. Rumble the earth. Come on, rumble the earth. Rumble the earth with your sound. Rumble the earth. Rumble the creation. You're about to decree that your one creation is waiting for. Let creation hear your sound. Let creation know you got up today. You didn't stay in the bed. You got up. Whatever slaughtered you this week, you resurrected. Whatever hit you, you healed. You healed. You're an avenger of the mighty God. You're a righteous one. You're a flaming fire. Come on, the creator. The creator. What do you have to say? What do you have to release? What do you have to establish? Let your sound go forth. Come on, we push in this place. We push on the atmosphere. We push on the climate. This is our climate. These are our heavens. This is our ground. This is our dominion. This is our reign. We take the sound. We take the atmosphere. We ask you for nothing. We take the atmosphere. Yes, yes, our God is King, our God is Lord, not the Prince of the power of the air, not our air, not our oxygen, not our molecules, not our atoms. Cause this is the home of the biotic gospel. Come on here, shippy host. Oh, yonder by seed. Every layer of the stratosphere, every layer of the exosphere, every layer of the heavens, we take it in the name of Jesus the Christ. We invoke the blood. We invoke the Godhead. We invoke the kingdom. We invoke our powers. We invoke it in Jesus' name. 
Hallelujah. Because identity is. Glory, God, stay in that uh, sound. Let's go. Who are we? I am. I was. I was in Christ before the foundation of the world. As he is, so are we in this world. I am the priest of the sovereign God. I am the sovereign elect of God. I am of the redeemed nation of Jesus Christ. I am a citizen of the holy nation. I am seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I am filled with the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I am Christ in me is the hope of glory. I am Jesus' way, truth, and life. I am the righteousness of God in flesh. I am the apocalyptic sovereign of creation. I am what creation is waiting for. I am the apocalyptic elect of God. Now come on, turn to your right and to your left. Just, just encourage the person next to you. You are that. Come on. Say you are that. You are power. You are righteousness. You are holiness. You are grace. You are might. You are the representation of his way. Come on, encourage him. Say don't let that adversary dupe you. Don't go the wrong way this week. Because you are the way, the truth, and the life. Don't let that death prevail. Don't let that marriage die. Don't let that child die. Don't let that relationship die. Don't let that promotion die. Because you are the life. Call it up. Call it up. We call it up. We speak to our Lazarus. Get out the grave. Get out the grave. Get out the grave. Woo, somebody say Jesus. My God. I felt like she was just getting started good. Going to have a seat. My God. In the heavens. How many of you have been listening to? You already know what I'm about to say? That Sunday sermon. Eve. Creation's first witch. That thing smacked me so hard. I was driving. I said, hold on. I need to hear that line again. You know how there's, there's, you can tell when God is etching something in your spirit and in your soul because you have to hear it over, like that one thing, over and over and over and over and over. And I thought, oh, no, keep playing. I said, oh. I said, Lord, this right here, the it's those. I mean, I feel like Dr. Price is a walking book of Proverbs. Because you can tell when it is eternal wisdom. Because it, it just hits in a place that you kind of just go, oh, I took a hit. I've been hit. And it was the hand of God hitting you. You can tell when somebody has immersed themselves in the word of God, but the mind of God and the spirit of God. That's what we want for all of you to be able to immerse yourself so that you can recognize the voice of God from the voice of Satan. So that you know when a spirit of seduction is whispering in your ear because you have so much of the word of God in you. He can call up that scripture as a defense to let you know what the enemy's doing. That's how that works. That's why you study your word to show yourself approved 
and it can be approved in the day of testing and trial when nobody else is around. And that word jumps up like a wall of defense. And all of a sudden where you were once weak, you are strong and you have a defense. When she was talking about Cain, I tell you, none of us really want to identify with, Lord have mercy, the things that the enemy has really tried to destroy, with the people in scripture who didn't do it right, right? We're, we're always, of course, striving for the ones who did, but you must study the ones who didn't so you know when those tests come your way, why they fail and why you're about to fail if you're not careful. And that's everybody and anybody. And when she was talking about Cain and breaking down, because I don't know about you, but for the most of my life, Genesis, you know, we have like skipping rocks through Genesis. In the beginning, let there be light. Boom. Skip, 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 skip. They ate that fruit. We always said an apple. Scripture doesn't say apple. Whatever. Skip, skip. You know, apple was easy to market. And then skip, 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 skip. Okay. Then we had, you know, Noah. If you went to a deep church, Enoch got an honorable mention. We don't know what he did. And then he just lived a long time and then was no more. And okay, and then you have Noah and you have all the key things that happen. And you just, we just kind of skip through a lot. And you don't realize until you go through the word, how much is a skip over and why we do have challenges. So when she was talking about Cain and sin lies at the door, but if you do right, all will, all will go well for you and how, Cain was that guy who always wanted God to bend the rules for him, but he still wanted the harvest on righteousness. And a lot of us can be that way. I have to watch. I think everybody has to watch where you don't realize you want, well, okay, the, I, this is the exception and that's the exception and okay, you know, whatever. But I see it. I see it this way, Alexis. I just feel in my heart, this is what the way God called me to do it. There's the line. This is the way God called me to do it. And this is just how, and this is what works for me. And you know, my habit, and we begin to make all these excuses like Cain. But look at the cost. And I was thinking about something and the Lord was like, see, that's that spirit of Cain. Wanting to not do according to what was written as it was written. You see how you allow your habits, your health, the, how much sleep you have or hadn't had, your schedule. Let's bring it down to everyday life. The way you see it to actually determine how you will obey me. Not just if. It, it doesn't matter if you show up on the premises of your job. You understand it doesn't matter if you're in the building, if you're not actually at your desk or your station doing your job. And then it doesn't matter if you're doing your job your way, if the institution says it actually needs to be done this way. Alvin, you, you are a car salesman. Like he can't just whip up some sort of, I had a prophetic dream last night from God about how I'm gonna change the car sales policy. And did you dream about your pink slip? Was that at the end of your dream? Did you wake up, right? And so, you know, he has, he is in an institution, has to follow the institution. And we have preached and taught church to be up to self-interpretation. However you see it is how it should be done. However you feel about it. Well, your feelings, feelings always got people in trouble. Your interpretation, which is why all these different translations of scripture are dangerous. And uh, he didn't believe that he said, if not, sin lies at the door. And his desire is for you. Know that sin is always desiring to take you out. Yeah, that was a good pause, even if it wasn't on purpose. Sin is always, what is it always doing? Desiring to take you out, take you out of your purpose, take you out of your destiny. Take you. Some people have looked up at the end of their life and said, how in the world did I get here? And that's Bible. You study kings, people who started out strong in God. There's that. It's not, it's usually one final decision in a succession of decisions. Moses lost it at the end with God, but actually he was always a problem with that temper because he murdered somebody 
never really paid the consequences for that murder. And in the end, when he disobeyed God, God was done with Moses. He did all of that for the Lord and did not cross over. He saw the promised land so he could see that God's word was true, but he did not enter in his brother, his sister, that whole family actually did not enter in to the promises of God that they spearheaded. You have got to think about those elements of your life and ask yourself, are all of these compromises going to be worth it in the end? Is shortchanging your experience and shortcuts and whatever, what's that going to look like 25, 30, 40 years from now for you? When you're looking at your children, they don't have the inheritance they should have had that you should have started. Now, if Moses and him hadn't started, Joshua would, what? He'd still be a, a child of slavery. So they did something massive in getting the people out. That's huge. But they did not receive the inheritance. Don't let your labor be in vain. Because you won't let God get into your soul. Moses' soul was never delivered from that rage and talking back to God. Some of us talk back to God so bad, it's a shame. Like the hand just didn't come down and be like, Psh. that temper, his internal disagreement, that ego that showed up at the end that was there in many steps of the way. Let the Lord crush you. Some of us think that we're walking through Warfare, like for the calling, when it's really consequences of our carnality. A lot of what we experience is not people coming against your mantle, your ministry, or the little seedling that it is right now. It's not. It's the consequences of the carnality of your own flesh. That is just boom, boom. Man, I know the things I've had to be delivered from, and I know the list that is yet remaining. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There's always a list somewhere because we're in this flesh. Can I say this today? To help you all understand why we're like, go back through these messages. Take those notes. Comb through the word of God. How many times do we hear it? What did you say? Don't take my word for it. Look it up. Study it. Dig deep into your word and let it dig deep into you. So it begins to talk back to you. His words are spirit and life. But they don't just actually jump off the page into you. We have to become. Yes, he writes them on our heart. Ezekiel 36 is true. But we have to walk it out and work it out in our own flesh. And be humbled and humiliated and devastated by the hand of God so he can rebuild us the way he needs to use us for the world that we're going into. This hot mess out here in the world and in the church is like nothing we have ever seen in our time, in our time. Now God has seen it plenty of times. That's why he's trying to warn you. No, no, no. You want to clean this up? Nope. You want to, mm -mm. okay. Because he, he literally, he holds the future. Did we sing it? We used to sing it. He knows tomorrow. He knows tomorrow, which means he knows why he's telling you today to do or stop doing something because he knows tomorrow. How you doing, Bree? He knows tomorrow. He knows what warfare. How many people did God tell to sell their businesses in 2019 and they didn't do it? So they went bankrupt in 2020. How many people did he tell in 2017, 2018 to cash out on certain things? Pull your money out of certain things. No, no, it's good. Riding that crest, it's good. How many people did he tell to move? How many people did he say it? There's a lot of loss that didn't have to happen. If they would have just had faith that God knew tomorrow. The unpredictable tomorrow. Oh, but it is predictable when you're God. Because he's already lived it. He's already there. He's like, no, I'm telling you, you, you want to get, Dr. Price told Prophet Marie, I don't know. Well, this was a while ago. You need to get a new vehicle. It needs to be this kind of vehicle. And now where does she live in Timbuktu? And needs that kind of vehicle that she has. 
<laughs> and he's like, wow, didn't see that coming. God did. It can be basic things, simple things that become big problems later. Big problems later. Oh, we, we want to get this house. We want everything is right. The Lord is like, stay right where you are in that little cramped apartment. That's not God because he wants me to be blessed. That's not God. He's trying to tell you the economy is changing. And then you're going to have that on your credit as losing a house or a car. But I don't want the Pinto. I want the Bentley. I want the Lambo. Well, okay. He's like, I'm telling you, Pinto is where it's at. Gas is now $9.99 a gallon. Man, wish you would have had that Pinto. You're trying to get a bike now. <laughs> oh, how's that Lambo doing? Going nowhere fast. Right. All of those areas that when your flesh is riding high, you cannot hear God. And when you hear him, you tell him he's a devil. Because it goes against what you want in the flesh. Or a late prophecy fulfillment. God told you to do that thing in 2015. You're ready now. He's like, don't do it. But I have an outstanding obedience. Oh, no, but the, but the harvest on that is gone. The economy on that obedience is gone. The era on that is gone. The audience on that is gone. And so you go, I don't know why it's not working. Well, when were you supposed to do it? 12 years ago. Oh, well, the Lord moved on. You didn't move, so he did. I mean, there's a lot to reconcile with the Lord in this season. And I think we always think that reconciliation is like, chief, huggy, huggy, we reconciled. Sorry, I ate your bag of chips. We're friends again. I couldn't eat your chips because you like those hot chips and I can't do it. So it's wonderful. She never has to worry in the house if I'm going to eat her chips. It's never going to happen. And I like the salt and vinegar. She's like, that's all you. So it's wonderful. But let's just say I lost my mind for a minute and set my mouth on fire. And we reconcile. But when you reconcile your bank account, we're like, oh, everything has to balance. The debt has to be accounted for. The income has to be accounted for. Everything has to tie to something to make sense. And God is like, no, this debt is tied to this disobedience. Just like this blessing is tied to this obedience, to this obedience. And God is balancing the books with a lot of us. Time to balance these books. They've been imbalanced because the doctrine has been imbalanced. Because after that whole prosperity thing blew through and blew out, a lot of people began to crash in their walk with God. And now we have all the people saying, that got out of control. Yeah, that got out of control. Yeah, well, after all this loss, thanks. We see that. We see that. So take these times with the Lord very seriously very seriously when he calls you to prayer pray because he knows what tomorrow he knows today when he tells you get up early leave your house early leave early because he knows if you leave at your regular time which might just always be late or just on time that calamity is going to be there at that time and we want god to move the calamity well just stop the calamity god He's like, I'm not going to stop a whole storm. I'm just going to redirect you, which I should be able to do as your God. How come he let that thing happen? How come the, that car crash happened? Why didn't God stop the crash? Why didn't you obey him when he told you not to go that way? Why did you give your kid the keys to the car? Because they had a tantrum and now you have a funeral. Don't blame God for bad behavior. Don't blame God for your disobedience. We're very good at that. Well, I can't have this. I didn't tell you to marry that person. I didn't tell you. I, and, and some people, I told you to marry that person. I didn't like them. They didn't like them. They didn't turn you on. They didn't do this. They didn't do that. And now you would all, see, listen, there are so many. Deliver, 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 deliver. See, we're going to stop lying on God. 
Because all of that false, that's false testimony against the Lord. That's bearing a false witness against the Lord. Well, you know, the last time I tried ministry, it just didn't work. Well, let's talk about how you did that the last time. And so while we're busy blaming God and how come and he, he's like, I'm not moving an entire, I'm not shifting a whole city for you. I need you to shift. I need you to move. You're the change agent, which change agents are the worst ones to change. I want you to know. Like we want everybody else to change. But a lot of us have to go into that prayer closet and repent. And I'm talking about that groveling, that ugly cry. You and God hollering, crying, sobbing. You'll know when you're repenting because you are broken. At how much time has been lost because of your foolishness. What God has lost because of your arrogance. Because of your pride in your heart. Can I say this to the congregation today? Am I just talking to myself? You have got to take a posture. And if you feel you have nothing to repent for, just go pray about that because all have sin okay we all have something and you need to pray that god gives you and grants you repentance because if he doesn't grant you repentance that means he has set to whoop your natural behind because of it whenever he will not even allow you to repent that means he has not assigned mercy to your deeds i ain't got nothing to do with i've said sorry oh that you haven't repented because if you still feel like in any way you have nothing to get on your face. And let me tell you, here's a test. I challenge all of you as I challenge myself in your own prayer time to get actually on your face on the floor. Now, if you might need some help getting up, you know, you have to get as low as you can. You might need to get in your bed and roll over. Okay. So <laughs> you might have to, you might have to get in the bed. Surprise. <laughs> Surprise. Look at here, look at here. You look at cute yourself, you know, man. <laughs> She's just got back in town. We got back in town last night from North Carolina. It was almost this morning, but it was still last night. That's all right. I'm giving God a praise yes. and I want everybody to know I walked that airport all by myself. Yes, she did. Yes, I did. Wait a minute. Let me just say this. So she's walks. Now, this is a testimony. Let me say it real quick and then I'll, you know, let you do right here. Because this do. is obviously your church. And, uh, and so she walked it. Now, if you don't know, for the last several, well, we haven't traveled for three years in airports, but several years before that, she always had to have a wheelchair. And so she was wheeled around because of back, knees, and all kinds of situations. So this time, she said before, I'm determined to walk. Now, I'm used to knowing exactly where she is because she's <laughs> locked in wheels. So on this trip, I look up and I'm like, where is Dr. Price? And we're getting on the train to jump, you know, terminals and then jump to the other thing. And I'm like, okay, she, cause she's going off, getting her seat, sitting down. And she's like, you know how she does? And I'm like, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. And so it was very uh, exciting and rewarding to see her plow yeah. through it with ease, I might say. Yes. You know, those of you who did not know me, I was really severely struck with uh, sciatica and all of this. And I am here today as a total testimony of a healing because you all haven't, you, many of you didn't know that. They used to have to put me in a chair and then help me get out the chair and then walk me to the place. And I just said to God, you know what? I'm called to do this thing and it won't look really good if I got to be limping and dragging. You're coming up here? Okay. <laughs> Have a seat. We forgot my gift. I got a gift, a young man, and you all are going to want it. A young man designed me some biotic gospel sneakers. Ah, <laughs> uh, got it. Um, I can email. I took a picture. Okay. She's going to see. I got, so I can, I can run. My feet are shod with the preparation of the biotic gospel. I said, when my people see these sneakers, they're all going to want some. 
He got the he's got the gene thing on there. He's got the biotic on one side. He's got it. I mean, and I I said, well, it's befitting that we would have sneakers that our feet would be shod with the gospel. So you can add that to your kit. Isn't that wonderful? God is so good. And and I, when they brought it out, I said, and he had the nerve to put them on a Nike. I said, well, all right. Y'all can't get a Nike, though. Y'all, y'all got to buy your sneaker and let him fix your sneaker. But this, I mean, he did a, she's going to put it up for you. It is very attractive. The color, the, I said, now that's branding. Can you imagine we're all just walking with our biotic gospel sneakers? Taking the nations, you know? I'm, and I'm just excited about that. I'm excited about being here. Uh, but today I want to talk to you about your spirit. So when she's done, did you get it? Oh, you're downloading? Y'all didn't download it faster? Look, how many, how many BPMs and MPCs and QRZs do we have? Okay, so we don't have all of that yet. But if you leave it to Dave, we're going to be zipping. Dave is going to see to it that we zip, zing, and all of that. Look at that. Those are my, blow them up. Can you blow? They are my biotic gospel sneakers. I, my, look at that. Come on, one more. Can you get one more? That is what I'm wearing when I'm doing this gospel. Hallelujah. And we got, we're going to get him to make another pair that just sits on the table. It's going to be a, a, a fake pair. I don't want them to be real because then folk be thinking that they can walk off with my. I am so excited. Thank you, ladies. But, you know, I, I want to talk to you about your spirit. First of all, the whole Eve as the first witch. And then Prophet Tamira had me do it on her show. And we need to know that as we talk about our spirit. Now, we talk about Eve being the soul. Remember that Eve is the soul. Adam is the spirit. Now, no matter how much they want to tell you that the, the father ha passes on some of that, the genetic uh, architecture, the blueprint, yeah, that's dad because it's the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. So the spirit gives life, but the soul is considered the flesh. The Old Testament uses the word soul in the King James Version almost 500 times. That tells you that it's very important and that in that era, it was the problem. So the Old Testament uses the word soul 500 times. In the majority of those times, it uses the word soul and spirit. They are together. And so I want you to hear this because it's important that you know and that you understand because we're, we're about to go really big with this and I need you all to listen to it so you can explain it because devils are, will be trying to unexplain it. So the soul comes from the mama. So in Eve's eggs was the soul of all humanity. Now God has the principle of firsts. And the principles of first is this. The first of anything determines everything that follows. It is not only a, a, a succession. It is a prototype. It, the first is the archetype. It is important that you know that Eve's soul died first because she ate first. Which is why the death of soul is something God can mend. Had Adam eaten first, it would have all been gone. It would have been a wash. Does that make sense to you all? If Adam had eaten first, it would have been a wash. It would have been the end of the end of the end. And so I just, you know, I want you to understand so that you're clear. 
and you, want, you recognize why we're on this journey. The thing, the, the closer for Eve, the deal maker, was that the tree's fruit would make her wise. So we, we talked at, on her show about how all those years, they looked at that tree. They never found it especially appetizing or tantalating or tempting. It was only after the serpent hypnotized her, caused her to see the tree through his eyes. That's how sin works. Sin makes you see itself through the tempter's eyes, through the seducer's eyes. I mean, it's kind of like, how you go and you you have a you meet a new friend and you like them and you know blah 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 but after a while the things you didn't like about them became endearing the offensive things like like there are those of us those of you because i probably not yet but those of you who have friends that cuss every other word well you didn't like it but after your um, emotions got fused with that reaction, you could tolerate it, and then eventually you, you indulged it. It's at the point of indulgence that you are your soul is lost. So they clearly chatted with this serpent for a while. And yet, we always I mentioned that Adam never had a problem with that serpent until he got a wife. The serpent, being the eternal, inhabited by the internal cherub that fell, understood God's principles and God's laws and God's rules. God has the principle of first. And the principle of first says this, this is the template. This is the archetype. This is the, what will reproduce after its own kind. The first is the first of the kind. Everything that comes from it reproduces after its own kind, which puts a real death knell in the homosexual agenda. Because someone changed their kind. Because God wouldn't make a kind that would die. He'd make a kind that would live forever because, well, he's the living God. So when you hear people say, well, you know, I was made that way. Yeah, you were, but not by the maker. The, that's, so the homosexual is the, is the serpent spawn. And it started with Eve in the soul. So Eve's soul, and I want to keep saying it because you all are going to have to get really good at this, and you're going to have to be good at explaining it. Eve's soul died first. Now, lay that, what I just said, lay that against the principle of the first of the kind. So the human soul, or the human, the, the solical part of the human genome died first. But it didn't matter because Eve did not get the command. The command came to the spirit of life in Adam. And until Adam ate, the entire human genome was safe. Had he just said, oh, hey, girl, you messing up. I'm sorry, I'm not going to follow you. Had he said that, God would have given him another Eve. But he didn't say that because his, his persuasion by the serpent and his understanding of the one of the kind made him think that God could not replace her. So he ate. When he ate, his DNA died because it is the spirit that gives life. The body without the spirit is dead. And the spirit controls the soul because control was given to the spirit first. And I love saying this because it's important that you understand the, that the spirit controls the soul. And if God's spirit has stayed in Adam the way it was, then that soul would have corrupted the spirit.
According to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, it says that your spirit can be made filthy. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But you have to understand, because Eve ate first, she created the first corrupt soul using the pattern and the principle of firsts. Does that speak to you all? Which is why it was important for the serpent to get her because the serpent knew that literally she could reproduce him in bodily form. And if he could just get at Adam's seed, he could reproduce himself in bodily form, which is why all the genome is hybrid, is hybridic, meaning it's part animal, part serpent, part human. Now, the mythologist knows that because the mythologist will show you all about the serpent. Today, they're trying to get you to fall in love with the reptilian part of the hybrid. The Asians, what my issue with Asiatic religions is that they're all about the dragon, which is the serpent, which is the reason we're where we are. So every time you turn around, they're trying to tell you, well, the serpent is a good thing. It's a good luck thing. No, it's not. The serpent killed the human gene. So if you don't understand that, then you won't be born again. Because in order to shed that, to get out of that, you must get the spirit that was in Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world. Before the world was. The reason we can get born again is because we were in Christ before the foundation of the world. Our genome, our genetics predate earth. It, let's go one step further. Our genetics predate creation. Because when God first brought his first begotten son into existence to answer what makes Christianity superior, what makes us superior is Christ. We were in Christ when God brought him forth the way your children are in you and have been in you since infancy except Jesus wasn't brought forth as an infant. He was brought forth as a full embodied replication, reproduction of the Godhead. So when you see in John 17, he said, you know, it, back in your bosom, he was born with you in him. Just like you were born with your children in you. Except that means we were born sinless. So we came, our origination is sinlessness. Something changed that. So let's take a moment and deal with sin. Sin in the theological mind is about attire and behavior. You have to act like this and behave like that and dress like this and dress like that. In the God realm, where sin originated, we don't want to talk about that, but if, you don't, if it didn't start in the spirit, it cannot be on earth. So when in the God realm, where sin originated, there was no behavior or anything. Before sin happened, God didn't have a law because he didn't need one. He had love. He built everything with his love nature, which is later on, Jesus' brother James introduces us to the royal law of love because until the serpent began to generate himself through the people or the being in God's realm, he began to inseminate and contaminate. Law was not necessary because when you love somebody, you don't need a law. You just need to learn. And then you just need to let that love in you lead you. The abuse we do to people is because of the hybridism that happened in the garden. You hate your neighbor because Satan hates God's creatures. 
You criticize your neighbor, you abuse your neighbor, you attack anything around you because God stripped that serpent of anything close to love, emotion, uh, love and affection, leaving them with the only emotion of hatred. So before God could bring the new birth to earth, Ezekiel could prophesy it because God had already mastered it. He had mastered bringing all those that died in his realm, meaning death in God's realm is being separated from God and then also being totally stripped, degraded of your original makeup. So once the separation happened with the serpent, the people could no longer hear God. What did Adam say? I was afraid. Fear was never in God's realm. Fear, fear came as the extreme antithesis of the Almighty. Because, I mean, truly, that cherub did not believe that he would actually not be able to reproduce the quality of his maker when he robbed his maker and he betrayed him. He really believed that all of that stuff that was in him, and it was not boxes like us. It was living, genomic material, spiritual material. Spiritual in this sense is incorporeal, meaning, because corporeal means dead matter. So he really believed that he could reproduce a, a, a body, a population of people who would rival his maker but serve him instead. And he did, except they were dead. So God now, because he has all of these dead beings that no longer love him genetically, that no longer love him congenitally, they now, because now they have mixed feelings for the first time. They're ambivalent about their world. They're mixed up. They're ambiguous about their feelings. They never had that. But now they do. And because they have that, God has to find a way to curtail this rampant hatred, this rampant death cell, this death genome that, that the, uh, the enemy has bred. Death meaning the complete opposite of how God brought himself into existence and death also being God's immune system. Because God's like, I'm not going down with y'all. That's why he has holiness out there. I just want you to understand, you come to me with a piece of Satan, you ain't cutting, you're not getting it. Because that's what Adam did. Adam brought Satan into his anatomical, physiological being. Now, Satan knew what he was doing. Adam was naive. So God has to create something called law. Now, you think he made it up, but he didn't. What he did was extend the law of himself. What he extended, what kept him, what keeps him alive, what keeps him right, what keeps him from deteriorating and from degrading and from, from decomposing, all of that God rejected and he put it in a whole other place and the serpent found or, or the cherub found that place and thought that it was going to make him better than God. I would venture to say that Lucifer did, had never even heard of death until he died which makes the garden a mini enactment or reenactment of that. How could he know what death was since God, he was made living without death properties or death influences? Because we get a taste of it in Paul's words in Corinthians which said, if he had known, he would have never crucified the Lord of glory. So he never knew God's secret weapon, but also his secret defense. Death is God's defense system. So because you get to that, and we see that with other, you get too close to God with the wrong spirit, he gonna, his immune system is going to wipe you out. Holiness is God's immune system. It's God's way of saying uncontaminated, but also uninvaded. We call holiness by words and text because that's what the Lord had to do. He had to then put scripture or scribe what he needed his people to know to survive the serpent's rampage. 
and he called it law. Actually, he called it a code. We ended up with law because he had to change their genetic codes because he had to, I'm sorry, regulate their genetic codes because the serpent had changed them. They're now mixed. They're hybrid, crossbreed. So that's the, the, the backstory. So now we know death originated in, he in heaven. We thought it originated in hell, but hell originated in heaven because God had to make some place to quarantine as well as to uh, curtail or imprison those rebel spirits. And he created hell. And he found out I can control them if I keep it on fire. Like we do. We use fire for a lot of things, don't we? So he filled a place of fire that would slow down, if not totally retard their, that virulence that they were using that was running rampant throughout his creation. So he created hell, and all every time they arrested, rounded up, one of his kind, one of Lucifer's kind, God put him in hell. That's where prisons originated. That's where incarceration originated. Everything originated in the spirit. I really wish you could hear me. And I wish God would paint it in you the way he's explained it and showing it to me. So when God says to Adam, you shall surely die, Adam was not the first death in creation. Earth was not God's first work. Because all that God is doing now, he's already perfected. The last thing he had to perfect was the literal human biology or anatomy or genome. Jesus Christ did that. So Jesus is the Godhead and he is, he's as invincible and impervious as the Godhead. Nothing can take him out, but he's got a population that is being bred or crossbred with his adversary. Now you can say, well, he could have put the devil in jail. Putting the devil in jail doesn't mean he's going to round up everything he's infected. And if God is not going to stop creating because he's afraid of what would happen, then he's not God. Because you have, see, we can know when you, you can know when you're moving in God's mind because God's a solutionist. He's not intimidated by consequences and results of uh, his creativity or of his um, supremacy. So he needs, he needs this devil to finish what he's doing in his realm, but he also needs him for the future beings that he will create and give the privilege of free will to. Because free will is not free if there's no options. That, okay? If God doesn't have options, then there's no such thing as free will. There's default. You got to serve God because. Y'all still loving me? I want you to hear this because you need to understand the power of what God did. So the serpent understood what made him God. And he said, knowing good and evil makes you like God. So Adam didn't know evil. He only knew good. He was still earning his God stripes. So the serpent knew. He also knew what was in that tree because what was in that tree was in him. And he was the breeder of the law of sin and death or the knowledge of good and evil. And when we, we, we travel down, and I'm going to revisit this over and over again because you all need to understand and stop thinking that witches and what have the answer. They don't have the answer. They're the disease. Every solical issue comes from Eve's mortality. And she, and she was able to be impregnated with Satan's kid. We can see that from Cain who was of the wicked one. So you need to stop chasing these internet things or talking to you about or giving you the falling God story. Why y'all fell? Why y'all here with us anyhow? Because Mike and Gabe not running up and down like that. 
the cherubim, we don't have cherubim running up and down like that because they know they're superior. And their superiority would really destroy us. We know that from Lot. So they kept, so Mike, Gabe, and all of the angels that we do know, they kept their first estate. Y'all are here because y'all came into our estate. You shouldn't have come into our estate. Now, our estate is that of humanity. So they became human by simply being downgraded. I don't think that when God punished them for leaving their first estate, they knew that it was going to make them like us. But they were already mortal or on the verge of because they were tempted. See, Lucifer didn't fall because he was tempted. There was no tempter. Again, law first. He's the original tempter. He's the original seducer. So he fell by misexercising his privilege of free will. He just misappropriated and he used it to fight his maker. He used it to defy his maker because he really felt like some people do when you're a leader. You know, you're, you're, people sit, sit in the pew and they see the leader. You have lunch with us and maybe you drink a little coffee or something. You feel like you know everything we know and you're just as good and you can do what we do just as well. You believe that until God kicks you out the garden. And the first thing you feel when you're kicked out the garden is stripped, naked. He takes your power. He takes your grace. That's why when you see people who started with God and they used to be rocking and whoo, this, oh my God, it was everything. And then you look at them and they all looking all sad. First of all, you can see the sadness in their eyes lost because the devil's eyes are now in their eyes. They're negative. They're moody. They're sorrowful and don't want to tell you, so they're using pride to cover the grief because they thought they were equal to what they wanted to defeat. That's why so many saints today have all the same eyes. You can almost tell a person who's backslidden by their eyes because they start looking very serpent-like, beady, round. That's how come I know when people are lost. Witches have all have the same eye set because there's some, uh, such a thing as called eye set, the set of their eyes. We know that crazy people. And since I don't subscribe to the witches policy of politically correct, I'm gonna say crazy. I'm not an occultist, I'm their sovereign. Because greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. And so you, you can get out there and think you got it going on. And the funny thing about God, because everything is biologic and biotic, it goes through the normal processes of the human body. Disease going through the way it goes through, you know. But it takes the path of a cancer. Why, why do you, you notice that the more occult we get, the more cancer comes up. They keep finding new cancers because that's devils. They're now etched in your genome. And they take, and they, they're doing with every cell what happened to Lucifer because he embodied cancer. He embodied sickness and disease. And he did it in his realm before he got flesh, he lost his eternal anatomy and he ended up with earth's clay anatomy. God put him in a serpent. Because God already knows that when he puts him anywhere, th things are going to die. Life dies, joy dies. And so you have to know that because you think that what he's saying and like with Eve, when he hypnotized her, at the tree looked good. It was pleasant to the eyes. It looked like it could be good food. Now you've got every tree, bush, you name it in the whole garden that you can eat from and have eaten from. But he 
hypnotized you to, with, to give you an appetite for the one thing you didn't want that he needed you to eat in order to enter you biologically to get into your gene line. So when we talk about uh, generation curses, we're not just talking about baby after baby after baby in line. We're talking about the genetic of the principality that won your line. Because the sons of God reproduced with the daughters of men. So that, and we know he took a third of the stars out of the sky. Didn't he? So he had a third of those angels. He had to give them a life in this dead realm. And he gave them the life by taking Adams. Because once they entered, once he entered Adam, he dumped his own genes. Because see, genes don't start when the, when the microscope can find them. Genes start when the spirit of life releases them. And they pick up corporeality as they travel from God's realm into the human makeup. So Adam literally hands the entirety of the human genome, the entire DNA of everything that's to be born in this world. The only people, the only things that escaped were the animals and creation. And they had to be downgraded. But no, because they weren't cursed. They didn't do anything wrong. But they would have been, they would have destroyed the humanity. So God had to make them less than Adam's lowest state. Interesting thing about that, just aside, because the animals never sinned, humanity did. God could no longer accept human blood as a cleanser. For atonement, he used the animals because they were innocent. He had to use the animals because they were innocent. Well, how do you know? How do we know that it was a sheep? Because clearly, they, they talk about the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. And what animal skin is easy to cover? Sheep. So God had to slaughter what was slaughtered in his realm, the equivalent thereof. I did a study of sheep, and you know, 20, 30 years ago, they told you how dumb sheep were, but you know what, then science got involved. Thank God for the scientists. Uh, one day they're going to meet Jesus, but they sure help us. And we find out that sheep are most like humans. Justifying scripture again. But if you just want to read your Bible and lay out under some palm tree and think that the Holy Ghost is going to give it to you osmotically instead of academically, then you will always come short of the revelation. So when you, you all need to study sheep because they're not the dumb animals. That was somebody hating Christian churches. So they try to make us think we all dumb and we all bought into it, but we better keep it at a fifth grade level because everybody knows she be dumb. When Jesus goes to heaven and he's celebrating, he, he goes as the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, according to Revelations 4, I believe. They're celebrating him. So God had to kill an animal because there was no other human to kill anyway. And the ones that he would have used were already killed because Satan had mortalized their soul. So I'm gonna ask a question here before I, 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 in a minute, because I want you to think on the answer to this. So Eve, I'm back to Eve, because you know Eve is the problem. And she's the problem because she's the prize. And she's surprised because she's eternity's version or was supposed to be eternity's version of God's other side, his feminine side. That's why the church is a woman. I know that's going to get me a lot of brownie points in the church. 
because you know y'all uh, men running around talking about it. God ain't never called a woman to preach. He didn't have to. He just became the wisdom that you preach. And we don't, and and, and they don't want to hear that because they've been wrong all these decades. But God has fired them because they're wrong, and He's getting ready to fire a bunch more because they're wrong. Because God, when you when you look at the Genesis story of creation, and then you look at the the Lord saving and all that we've gotten in the King James version, you keep saying, "Well, where's the women?" But that's Brahmic, because in Brahma, women come from his, the sole of his foot, which is why they feel they should be walked on. That is why women are crushed under their men. Jesus Christ has had to come and say, no, no, I got her from the rib. I got them side by side. As long as Eve stayed under the, stayed with, let me get this right, stayed with her husband's command and not eating from the forbidden tree, they were equal, so equal that Adam had to name her. Her name was Adam. Because when he called Adam, they both came. When she broke the sign that, that their soul tie was broken, at least the God, the one God established is because he has to name her. He has to call her. She's no longer feeling him and she's no longer hearing him. So we're moving on. So she eats and she dies. So the first soul to die was a woman's soul. Adam who was first in everything, his soul dies secondly. The principle of the first means she reproduced a kind of soul that's doomed to hell. And she reproduced a kind of soul that God had to judge. Now, I was just talking with Lovey. We're going to show some videos next week. And he was telling me how science has proven the whole mitochondrial Eve thing. Because I told you, they know. So if there's a mitochondrial Eve, hallelujah, there's an ecclesial wisdom who's above her. The mind of Christ. The soul of Christ. Proverbs 8, 22 to 26, I believe. But she said, God, wisdom. Every, the whole church is Proverbs 8 in terms of our earthly power, our soul power. It's Proverbs 8. And we get to verse 22 and it said, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way. Before ever his works of old. Oh, see y'all, see, I need y'all to listen to my teachings. I need you all to listen because you want to fight this with the move that didn't make it or the move that God is finished with. Well, all I know is the Bible say, well, they wrote some Bibles themselves and they're teaching yours for the record. They're teaching your Bible. You have got to get the accurate scripture. So when they start talking about, well, you know, um, our God, your God. No, no, no. Like you hear them talk about, and how many of y'all bought into that? Well, you know, Allah just means God. Yeah, but it doesn't, that's not his first or last name. Because Allah does not mean Yahweh. Yahweh means something different altogether. Yahweh is the covenant God. Yahweh is the, uh, the creator God. Yahweh is Allah's maker. And in Yahweh is Yeshua and the Holy Ghost. So you're not going to sell me on that. I know y'all like to buy that because it's easy. I'm not buying that. That's like somebody saying everybody named Paul is just alike. And it's really funny. You can put 15 Paulers in the room and let someone who knows every one of those 15 say their name. And each one will say that name and it will resonate a different frequency. 
And the right one, the one they're talking to, will answer. Or at least say, are you calling me? Are you talking to me? We can have a million Michaels, but they're not all the archangel. And, that, and their story came after ours. The Bible is the last of every other, now you're going to like this, every other ancient text. It's the last of it because it's the cleanup. Church is the cleanup woman. So God let, let Satan, he always let Satan dump his guts. And then he said, okay, when sin is full grown, then it brings forth that, oh, okay, now we can act. When God says fullness of time, he means that's the fullness of what Satan dumped in a particular generation or in a particular dispensation. But you have to know this. You have to know this. And I, am, I thank God I lay in my bed sometimes at night just weeping because he trusts me to know this. And he just pulls up a chair and just starts talking. So you know, but when he said in Proverbs 8, I listen to Proverbs 8 nonstop because that's the power, the innate genomic power of the new creation. That is the queen of eternity. The church is the queen. We got king of kings. The church is queen of queens, not queen of heaven. We're, we're their queen. We are that. So when you read that all of the sons of God, that has to do with Satan's issue with women, but it also has to do with his, the power. It speaks to the power he seized over Eve. You know, identity is the key to destiny. And you have got to know who we are. God has one male seed. That's Christ. That's the only male seed that will live forever. Everybody else is going to become asexual. I know y'all think when you get there, y'all going to have this hot time with the wife and the husband you left. That's not going to happen. You're going to meet siblings. Because they did not, the reason that God, they went from being male and female to man and woman is because of their reproductive calling and material. Because in heaven, they were male and female. In God, they were male and female. And when you leave here, you all will be male and female again. And we will be relatives as siblings. I, heard, I said that to a man. He said, well, then I don't want to go. I said, well, if you think burning up all for, forever is better than giving up your little, come on here, then you do need to be in hell. You, that's where you need to be because if you can't make the difference between that, last we'll talk about can somebody cool my tongue. Psalm 45 has something very interesting. You all should read it in, um, in, um, in the scripture because it talks about the king's daughters, but it also talks about David, about the queen. Verse 9. It's, this is all about Jesus. It's indicting him, but I want to read verse 9. King's daughters among thy honorable women, upon thy right hand did stand the queen in gold of her fear. Hearken, O daughter, and consider and incline thy ear. Forget also thine own people and thy father's house. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy lord, and worship thou him. Now, we say God doesn't have any kind of a dress code, but this is kind of interesting. Verse 12, and the daughter of Tyre shall be there with the gift. Even the rich among the people shall entreat thy favor. So this is still about uh, Jesus. The king's daughter, all glorious within her clothing, is of wrought gold. She shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework. The virgins, her companion that follow her, shall be brought to you. So God has, the way we look today coming to God, that's not royal. That's not royal. That's rugged. So we believe in coming to the king in rugged wear. 
Life's hard, the hardness of life in these garments. The harshness of living on earth. The harshness of the soul that Eden, Eve sold to the serpent. So he was telling me with Eve how about the mitochondria, Eve. Now, I've been saying that for, what, about a year and a half. I've been saying, but, but Eve's mitochondria becomes a powerhouse of sin in humanity. As well as everything else about her femininity. And it's important that you recognize that. With Adam, we got the reptilian thing. Everybody's about the reptilian brain, you know. Psychologists got to teach you about the reptilian brain. And you know the saints, that's not true. We didn't yeah, you were. We, we were downgraded to snakes. We were downgraded to hybrid snakes when God took the, listen to how this thing worked out. So he says, he puts the curse out there. On your belly, you shall move all the days of your life. So God took his feet. So he starts, he enters humanity and he gets mobility, upright mobility. Again. Yeah, see, you got that, didn't you? And his, that was his thing, because as a dragon, he had feet. He had arms and feet. Looked like a weird version of a kangaroo. But God took that in the garden. And his hybridism returned him the ability of upright walking in strides. And you look at him today, you can tell that, that, that these are his kids. We're going to put some horns under your head. You're going to have your fake, a whole cosmetic makeover that you can look like a dragon because you think that brute strength is going to supersede the God strength. Christ in us, the hope of glory. And so you think, and, and, and what does Satan use? He used fear. Look at all of, just the majority of the movies. I won't say, oh, that's not true. But the majority of all entertainment is about making you afraid. It's because fear kills faith. It supplants your faith. And so you have movies from your little kids. They got to learn the dragon. We got to learn the, you know, we have put the magic dragon for the kids that don't know that they being scared to death. Okay, and you've got dragons, you've got serpents, you've got lizards, you've got all of that, and you're and, and we're trying to say, and they're trying to tell you we are the power. Now, what we're doing, we got people sniffing and snotting at the off altar, talking about I'm mad with Jesus because he didn't keep my mother alive. Are you kidding? You died in Eve, so your mother was doomed to death just like you are. Some go early, some go late. Humans are born with dead souls. That's why we get dead bodies. The soul is converted, but it's not immortal and not in that and not with immortal life. So you have got, we, while we write all of these stupid movies that don't reflect anything about the power of God except love. All of the potencies that's in the scripture. Elijah, we don't have movies that talk about Elijah teleporting anywhere he wants to go, calling down fire from the heavens. We, and, and, well, you know, the Bible said we can't do that. We cannot. You couldn't do it until he got on the cross. Once he rose from the dead, we got all power, all means all. We can go back to calling down fire if that's what God wants to do. And that's just a couple of the things, because you know those, those people who approve the scriptures, you know good and well, they cut out a lot of Elijah. Because there was a reason why he was a scary man of God. The apostles, just in case we say, because this is the Jesus say that don't, don't, John, James and John, don't call down fire because, you know, you're not here for that. Jesus is like, I don't need you killing people until I get on the cross and I go and create the new birth so that they don't die and go to hell. I'm trying to keep as many people on the planet as I can until I rise from the dead and ascend on high. Because now we go down and we come over here in the book of Acts and Peter said, listen, what y'all do with that money? Uh. <laughs> 
What did you do with that money from the house you vowed to, to sell? Use my power to grace you to sell because you're supposed to bring it to us. So what did you do with it? The boy hadn't even finished talking. And, and Peter withdrew that life, withdrew that mantle on that flesh, and he drops dead. Wife comes. Honey, I'm here. <laughs> Pete, so tell me, when you and your husband sold that house, what did you do with that money? Well, okay, well, the feet of those who took your husband out, now even they're coming back to get you and you will not be walking out you'll be carried out too so this is to say so is Jesus confused or is he talking about the dispensations we go down there Paul okay turn them over to Satan so they know not to blaspheme that's why devil Satan doesn't want apostles to come to the knowledge of the truth. They don't want them to come into the fullness of their knowledge and their power. Paul said, no, I got authority y'all can't imagine. Which is why he has to grace us with grace. We got to get some grace and some patience because we've been wiped out every time. And I, I, I can tell you the truth, man. There are times that you have to come after people's sin. Because that sin is infectious. It's contagious. When your church start bleeding now and you, they, they keep running their mouth, I come after them. I, I, I promise you I do. You're not going to go in out here on a lie and tell a lie and keep us struggling and have the naive chasing your lie. We're supposed to watch over your souls. Didn't say your spirit though, did it? Because your soul is what's being sanctified. It's being converted. And your soul is learning something that's very hard for it. You know what that is? It's learning the new creation spirit. It never met it. Doesn't know the spirit. Doesn't know the Holy Ghost. Doesn't know your new spirit. Doesn't know your new heart. So the spirit's job is to train your soul to become as it was before Adam fell. Become as it was, as it is in heaven. Because your soul is to become Jesus' soul. Did y'all hear that? Yeah. See, because if y'all feeling like it's a little bit, y'all bind, bind up your devil, slap him. We teach you that your soul is become as the first Adam, but the first Adam didn't have sense enough not to eat and didn't discern the serpent. Because he was not, he did not know good and evil. Your soul is to become the soul of Jesus Christ. That's the soul that went to heaven without a reason other than you. Having done no sin, he's still in heaven. Your sin was put on him, and because your sin was put on him, he was doomed to die. He could never go back home. You hear people say, Jesus didn't have to die. Yes, he did if he wanted to get back home. He had to die because flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. And the king can't be flesh and blood and helping you get home. I know you thought I forgot, but you know I don't forget. Verse 21, the power of God's first lady. His first lady of creation is wisdom. Wisdom has children. Wisdom is justified in all of her children. Wisdom summons apostles and prophets. Wisdom, if that's the case, is ruling the church under Jesus Christ or beside him. Wisdom is the principal thing. And wisdom is where wealth comes from. Verse 21, 821. Well, let me do this. I lead in the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of judgment that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance and I will fill their treasures. And, the, and then goes on to say, who, why, why I'm great. What makes me great? The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. That's why Lucifer can sell it or the serpent can sell it to Eve. 
because she had this internal prototype to archetype. See, we, nobody cares about the female archetype. And this is not a feminine thing. This is ecclesial because the church is a woman. The church is his bride. The church is the bride of Christ, wife of Christ. So I know that it, it's nice to be macho. Please don't lose your macho because you got to fight them macho devils. But understand, when it's all said and done, your gender will not matter. That's why homosexual, homosexuals can't go to heaven. They can't be born again unless they run to repent. So there's no such thing as a Christian homosexual, just like there's no such thing as a Christian witch. Oh, y'all, did y'all like that? It is impossible to be a Christian homo, at least a born again homosexual. You can be an institutional one, but you cannot be a constitutional one. So they can sit there and say all day long, and that's why they mean. You ever notice they mean? Those are mean people because them devils are mean. And they're fighting for their turf. They're fighting to keep their place in these bodies, in these people's souls. So those of you say, well, I don't care what my son is and my cousin is. God doesn't care. He said, well, then you go to hell with them because they're not coming to heaven with you. Well, God is love. I know, but his name's not Cupid. He's not, a, he's not Adonis. He is not Apollo. So those are all lust love gods. So we're talking about lust love? Yeah, but those are not in God's realm. So God got rid of them before the whole thing was over. They were part of the one-third stars that, was, that the dragon's tail cast to the earth. So are you saying that I should hate my so-and-so? No, you shouldn't hate your family. God did not tell you to hate them. But you need to stop lying to them. You need to stop telling them that, that your God made them that way. Because your God did not. By default, when you reject God, you get by default everything he rejected. You know, that was good. I just, hold on, Jesus. Wait, wait a minute, Holy Ghost. When you reject God, everything that God rejected for himself, you become. He doesn't have to make you gay. Your rejection of his truth. He said, I will send them strong delusion. Well, what do you think delusion is? That comes from his vault of rejection. That they would believe the lie. Now, modern translations say a lie, but in God's realm, there was only one lie. That was a lie of the serpent. I mean, the, well, the cherub that became serpent. So here she goes. She says, um, verse 22, wisdom. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. Do you know how old that makes us? That makes us before earth, before there was a time zone, before there were galaxies that were tracking, before he threw them in the sky. Wisdom was with him working. And he said, I was set up from everlasting. From the beginning or ever the earth was. When you hear the creation story, do you hear this? You don't hear this in the creation story. But God had a wife back then, at least a template therefore or thereof. And he named her wisdom. And, she, and here she goes on. When there were no depths or waters, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. And when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depths, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him. Ooh. That means in the broadest, broadest sense of the term, we were part of creature and creation. We were in him. You understand that even if, you're, if a woman is pregnant, that baby is still credited with what that mother is doing, at least according to Hebrews 7. Levi was in his lawns because Levi was in his lawns. He was accounted to have paid tithes. He said, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. 
rejoicing in the inhabitable parts of his earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. Now, you want to say, well, and if she's before earth, well, because earth existed according to Ezekiel 28, and according to Isaiah 14, earth existed, but not with us. That's why that claim to a 7,000 year earth, the a young earth, is wrong. The earth is older than that. And I mean, I, I don't know if 13 billion years is it or not, but I do know that the earth is older than 7,000 years. I don't even know who came up with that theology. By the time we count Methuselah and all the other people that are near 1,000 years, we, we already ate up the 1,000 years before the, before the blood. But see, if you don't know your Bible or if you decide to read it according to how somebody who misread it teaches you, then you will be in error. Wisdom was beside God in creation. And wisdom is God's ecclesia. We have the answers. We have the witness because we were in Christ before the foundation of the world. The wisdom that Eve got was the serpent's wisdom, which got him killed. So she got mortal wisdom, but we have eternal wisdom, the everlasting wisdom of the resurrected Christ. So when you're born again, you get Jesus' soul, Jesus' Godhead, you get a new spirit, you get a new heart, you don't get a new soul. That you must work through the milk of the word, prayer, fasting, conversion, repentance, and all of that other stuff. So every day, your soul's sins are remitted by your new creation spirit that's being nurtured and being developed by the Holy Ghost on the inside. Now, you know how people keep saying that we're not under law, but we're under grace. That's a lie, too. Because the new birth comes with the law of God. The same law that kept God God is in you. The same law that law that make God impervious, invincible is in you. That's why Jesus could say, don't think I came to destroy the law. I did not. All of this hyper grace teaching, that's false teaching. That's from another devil. That's somebody, that's Satan who decided, oh, you want to rise? Let me confuse you. Let me give you my side of the story. So they're telling Satan's side of the story because the Bible said that when we got born again, he said, I will, what? And then mind, in their hearts, and then put them where? In your mind. And then he said, I'll put my spirit in you and I'm going to walk in you. So we are walking, talking, living vessels of the law of God. We are the Ten Commandments, not on paper, not on brick, on the soul. So, so how did he take the church out? By making you all think that lawlessness is liberty. And how you feel it and how God affects you. Do you know those are the tenets of witchcraft? You need to see how much of this theology they have appropriated. So that you would be free enough to be enslaved by them. They liberate you from Christ to enslave you to their gods. And you, be, you bind it. Because let me tell you something. Humans cannot be a free agent in creation. We lost that in the garden. There's no such thing as a being a free agent. We're going to serve one God or the other. I'm almost done. So when we start talking about walk in the spirit... We are not walking in the spirit lawlessly. Because in order for you to move, some spirit has to be your engine. Some spirit has to be your power pack. Because the law first, everything that comes from it is after its own kind. Everything that comes from it is after its own kind. So you could think you're free 
And you could think, listen, I can do this. I can do that. I can go to church. I can stay at home. I can go to, to the bar. I can go out. I can whore around. I can go and do whatever I want. I can start a bit. I don't need God. You know how many people say they don't need God? God is so stealth. He's always in stealth mode. He's like, you can say what you want, but I'm in charge of this. And when your sin finished growing up, it's going to kill you. It's going to kill the thing that you idolized. If you idolize your liberty, that sin is going to kill it. You're going to find yourself enslaved or, or, in, or captured by something. I don't care if it's just a disease that keeps you from moving around. Your free will is in the toilet. Or you'll get into a relationship where they whoop you behind every single day. That's your free will. Because when your sin got full grown, what you idolized became your captor. So you hear, that's why you see people and they seem like they got, they the bomb, they got it right. Da -da, da -da, da -da. And you see them five, seven years later, they dragging or something, run, walking with a, t whatever. Isn't that the truth? You know why? Because sin can't heal. It doesn't exist to heal. It exists to kill. And sin is a nature before it's an action. In other words, the action can't come without the nature. Is this all right? Do you all hear me? So before you, you act like a sinner, you have to be a sinner in nature. Or you have to have adopt the tempter's nature for that action. That's why rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Because the soul died because of rebellion. And its death bred an entire infrastructure that would hate its God, hate its maker, and seek to destroy. And you know it, I keep saying, but Eve's first kid was not Adam's. Now, Satan may have used his body, but the sperm that, that fertilized that egg was not Adam's sperm. It might have been his genetic material, but the spirit of life in it, because you know the spirit comes from the father. Soul comes from the mother. So when you walk and sit there and talk about, well, I'm sorry, we just love each other. We're going to have a bunch of babies. You better make sure. Babe, I think y'all need to start investigating spiritual profiles. So how many times did you get your palm read? How many, how many religions did you try before you got to Jesus? Or did you get to Jesus? How many gods did you interview before you chose Christ? And not, not be led away with blind passions that you don't know what's going on. I could go with them if they say, well, you know, I was raised in Sunday school. My grandma took me to church. I couldn't get out of church as a kid. But when I became an adult, I said, I'll never go to church again. At least I know something Jesus is in me. We can grow that. We can work with that. You know, Jesus said the seed of, a, of the grain of a mustard seed. So we can work with that little grain. But you're not going to tell me that you were in some sort of wicked movement for 25 years. I have to now hear from God that you clean. And not only that, I'm going to say something that's pretty stunning. You, those people are saved, but sin has to be paid. The wages of sin is death. Sin has to be paid. It's issuing an invoice on your soul every day until that debt is paid. There's a reason why it's an invoice. There's a reason why it's an invoice. Because you owe something within for listening to his voice. I'm almost done. But see, why are you telling me this, Dr. Price? Are you telling us this for us to be afraid? No, I'm telling you this so you can take control of your soul. Your soul should be under your control. In my 3D book, I write, 
everybody has a soul, but not everybody's soul is under their control. So you need to wake up every day and say, who's controlling my soul? Who did I give the rudder to? Who did I give the lever to? Who did I give the power to? Because the reason we have soul issues is because you've allowed something else to control your soul. Or once you got saved, that devil is fighting to keep control. Your soul is your control. The church keeps teaching you about your spirit. Meanwhile, your soul is kicking butt in the natural realm. It's still run by devils. The spirit never needs deliverance unless you have gone reprobate or apostate. The deliverance that you get after salvation is the deliverance of all of those residents in your soul that are calling the shots on your life that are deciding your will that is what 3d does we walk you through all of those residents and occupants and they're not the same so you have to make up your mind that you want to learn god your soul doesn't know jesus it doesn't know your spirit your spirit knows the holy ghost your soul is like what who are you why are you here and it begins to harden itself against your new creation spirit. And because your new creation spirit comes into existence a seed, it's a lot of years before it can fight back. But you can fast track it by filling it with the word and understanding how you must strengthen your spirit and give your spirit full control. Because the, the reason your spirit does not have the same control right away is because the, it's in the world of the dead, the realm of the dead. Dead means hard, dead means decaying, dead means brittle. And that, so the brittleness of your body and the brittleness of your soul come together and push back on God's righteousness. And so, you know, when people want to call you, you know, they like to call you, well, you're a fanatic. What do you mean fanatic? Well, I mean, you know, like you're really crazy for God. You mean like you're crazy for sin? At least mine bring life. Yours is automatic death. See, so you have to know how to answer this devil. Well, yeah, but that, that's religious as opposed to what well, irreligious? Where you are fighting something you know not and you think you're in control. I'm a, I'm a fanatic because Jesus is in control. You're a fanatic because your devils are in control. The only difference is I got one devil, you got we don't know how many that you got to negotiate with to get through a day. That's why people have these up and down moods. We don't know what devil is calling the shots at what time. I'm almost done. See, cause people, and people play with you, you know? They play with you. I was dealing with somebody this weekend and they decided that they wanted to play with me. They had all of their layers. Did they have all their layers of their religion and stuff? And, I, and so they kept pushing back. I was like, see, you, they didn't tell you about me. I said, because well, tell me I'm wrong. Don't tell me I'm wrong. You know why? Because I don't speak if I question if I'm right. If I have a question about my rightness, I will not talk to you. So when I open my mouth, I've already answered the questions. I said, so let me tell oh, is that my, oh, just a minute, baby. We're going to get you. Come on, put something in her mouth. But this is what I said to her. I said, so I know you like to say that. I said, and that's your cover story. That's what you like to do because you feel like people can't discern it. So let me tell you, God is talking about the prayers that you just prayed and the things that you lived in your childhood. Now I'm looking into the vault of your childhood and I'm going to tell you what I'm seeing. I'm seeing that it's standing in the way of every prayer you pray. So if you do not get in God's word, this thing, I don't, God said, you can ask me, it doesn't matter. It's not going to happen because your stronghold are not letting you go. They didn't catch me. Yeah, well, I'm just trying to do things. So I just, I just, I'm, I'm, you want to talk to me now. I'm trying to work. I said, whatever. By the time I started preaching, when I finished giving that word, uh, so Dr. Price, when you said 
when you told me about the whole Bible and, and the soul thing, um, could you repeat that? Because I don't think I got it. See, we have to be masters because prophets are soul masters. That's why the Old Testament is about the prophets. Because prophets are soul masters. They're supposed to get in your guts. They're supposed to go where no devil has ever gone before. You talking about us being in your business? No, baby, we build, we're, we're in your basement. We go where the devil's lodge, and we're running through your genetics. And we're because every cell is a thing in itself, so every cell got a piece of your story. And I said, I just need you to understand that God's not playing with mature saints. Y'all are not babes any longer. Y'all going to come forth as pure gold adults or y'all going to stay corrupt? Because God has already lived with your loss. Your, the losses you he's already living with that. When they, oh, that's why God starts everything with a prophet because he got to start with the soul. And the prophet is the soul master if they train. That's why psychologists seem prophetic. The reason that you need to know, if you don't read your Bible, you're going to treat people according to the devil that bound their seed. And you're going to make them, as Peter said, a twofold child of sin. And when I said that to her, I was like, because I want you to, I don't care who promoted you too fast, too slow, not enough, too much. I don't care. Your soul, your gifts can take you where your soul can't keep you. And if anything is going to prove that you shouldn't have been there, it's the collapse of your soul from the pressure of your, your premature elevation. Now, I'm going to read this scripture and we're done. That's why you get in position, you get promoted, your whole life goes out of whack. Because we put you where your soul can't keep you. You don't have the infrastructure in your soul. You don't have the righteousness in your soul. You don't have the fortitude. You don't have the integrity. All you want to do is show off. And if we promote you because you're show off, we set you up for failure. I'm just saying. So Paul says, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Did he say it? You will die. And you know why? Because the flesh is dead and it's only going to compromise your new creation spirit. It's kind of like God, the spirit is the new organ that's been translated because your liver was corroded with cirrhosis. And then you go and two years later, you're back to drinking. So you're living according to your past life. Your spirit is an entire entity and it is, a, it is a divine organ and its job is to bring everything out of death into God's life. He said, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. He didn't say, I'll kill you. He didn't tell Adam he was going to kill him. But if you, through, if you through the spirit mortify the deeds of the flesh, you shall live. And so we taught you that is just if you live through the Holy Spirit. No, how about your new creation spirit? That's fused with the Holy Spirit. You need to live according to that new spirit that was in Christ before the foundation of the world. And when your spirit grows up, when it matures, I want you to know it takes over. I'll be taking over now. And it will begin to train you, train your soul to be like Jesus. And it will restrain your body by strengthening your will. That's another class. I'm going to give you this last one. And then I'm going to go and be done. Okay. What is meant by spirit? What did God mean by spirit? Don't you want to know? 
So let's look at that. I have an acronym. Galatians 5.16. I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Your spirit is powerful enough to destroy your lust because Jesus' spirit was powerful enough to destroy all the lust that, that you had that God put on him. Galatians, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. So you do have to live in the Holy Ghost, but your spirit is fused with the Holy Ghost. And it is the intermediator, it's the infrastructure, it's the mitigator between your the life of Christ that was taken out of you or your, gen, your genetics when God left the planet in the garden. He's restoring you to what was in Christ before the foundation of the world. You should have a blast trying to figure out who you are. You should have a good time saying, whoo, that's new. That's great. Because the more you fill yourself with the word of God, the more the superpowers of the Godhead awaken and they begin to take over. And all of a sudden, you know what you couldn't know. You move what you can't move. You become even greater than Elijah. See, the witches don't want you to know that. That is why we're the witness that we're better than what they are. They have to use dirt and dust. They got to get slimy. They got to be nasty. They got to be sleeping around with everybody. 77 billion sperm got to be running all over them. The, 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 literally, the, the excrement, they got to do excrement. Why? Because Satan couldn't, he did not expect to become a 100% antithesis of the whole almighty. He thought he could pick and choose. He could cherry pick the parts of God he wanted to keep and the parts he didn't want to. All of these here, all of these toys and whatnot, you see, you don't go to their meetings. If you go to their meetings and see some of the nasty stuff they got to do for those devils to oblige them. We don't have to do that. We got one Holy Ghost. And as he is, so are we in this world. One Holy Ghost. But I'm going to tell you right now, the gifts work, the faith works by love. But I'm going to tell you, you think you can will God's power and treat him any old kind of way, you are sadly mistaken. Because God threw out the cherub. He's not even going to let him in. He started making everything else on earth. So he's not going to let you in. Some of you all, you will never move to that place in God because you love your freedom too much. You love your independence too much. You love being different. You love being moody. You love being hateful. You love being mad. You love being indifferent. You love being cute. You love being sexy. You love, you love your flesh too much. But if you are one of those who can say, Look at your flesh, and that is the, those are all signs and emblems of Satan's fall and his weakness. I don't care how much he can move when I move when I don't care how much he can stop a storm, I stop storms. I'm talking about, but I've got to be as he is. I want to walk like this man, talk like him. I want to be like the like Jesus did. He came mortal and pigs dropping at the feet. We know you that son of the most high God. Please don't put us out before time. You have got to decide if you want to be their template or the Almighty's template. And if you're the Almighty's template, we don't have to argue with you about more fornication. We don't have to argue with you about why you can't lip and lick and laugh and date and whatnot. We don't have to do that because you know what? Superior people stay in their superior place. That was a problem with the devils. Kept not their first estate. They did, they did not know that they were superior or they didn't care. That is who God's talking to in Psalm 82. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. Did I not say ye are gods? And you're going to live a different life. And I'm going to talk to you about that as we go forward in the future. I know this was long, but I needed you to get this, but I needed it to be out there so that people can watch it and visit it and tear it up. Because let me tell you, when this thing work, works, you walk differently. When it works, you talk differently and you don't act like you're a subject because you know you're a sovereign and you know that. And, 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 and when you have spiritual warfare, you tell the devil, this is not going to do it. I got one that keeps trying to tell me what I think. I'm not going to tell me that you hungry. I don't want to eat that. Because you, you, once you get up, the, 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 si the, the, the wall of silence is destroyed. And you better be able to answer with the word. 
You have to be able to say that. I'm not doing that. I'm preaching this gospel. Every day I wake up and tell, so y'all listen. I'm preaching this biotic gospel. I'm going to preach it all over the world. I'm going to love Jesus Christ, and he and I are going to be one forever. And when Jesus leaves, I'm out. But you understand, I know I outrank you. I outrank you because you were lost, you were dead and rejected before I even came into existence. So you already came into existence as the floor, as the ground. You're going to have to stop acting like, oh, I mean, uh uh-uh, no. And they're going to do nasty things in front of you, and you're going to have to be, you know, act like Marie did when she had to do all that nasty stuff to get that master's degree. You have to see all that nasty. Don't be moved by that. Because kids are bratty, and brats have tantrums. Give God a praise. Pumpkin, where are you? Pumpkin. Come on. Lincoln, you come too. Oh, look at her. I just love these babies. I just get all excited. I feel like I'm getting all these grandchildren. I'm loving them. Oh, look at her. She's got a little bow in her hair. Come on, fam. Isn't he fam? Shouldn't he be here? Uh Okay, I thought he was. Oh, you're taking pictures. Oh, you're excited. I got it. Pumpkin, pumpkin, hey, pumpkin, yeah, look at you. She is so chatty. This is the chattiest baby. This girl better be a public speaker. Hey, girl, I just thank God for you. I thank God for the, look at her. She's chatting. Come on, I don't get so cute. I can't get through this. (laughs) Look at you. You're so cute. I can't even get through it. Look at that. I can tell you all give her a lot of attention and a lot of conversation. She's very alert. Well, I'm asking God to bless. Where's the oil? I got to anoint the baby. Yeah, you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you eat? Because, see, I know you get hungry. You know, They tell me you go there. Okay, because, you know, they tell me she goes there. <laughs> Your feet are for the gospel. Yeah. And your hands are for healing. And your head, in Jesus' name, God, give her peace. Make her the, just the most peaceful, precious ever. We bless you. We anoint you to fulfill the gospel. We anoint you with the word of God in your mouth early. We anoint you and we baptize you for the calling that you'll have, for you will do great things in this planet. And I thank you that your parents will remember these words. Make sure that you get the education and the academics that will fit your calling because you have a lot that you're going to do. But you know what? God wants her to be a doctor. So that means you're going to have to start learning early, putting it in her brain because, you know, they never want to do what God wants to do. (laughs) And we bless you. I bless you, Araya. I bless you in Jesus' name. I bless your mind, I bless your eyes, I bless your heart, and I ask God to cover you, that you only have great teachers, great friends, and great alliances throughout your life. I bar anything that would destroy your destiny, in Jesus' name. Yeah, I know, she is something else. She just wants to get over, and we make you a a wonderful big brother, a great big brother. You see to it. You watch over her. You understand. Amen. Oh, oh, wait a minute. I got to give you the paper. We bless you, Mom. Stop being afraid. And the Holy Ghost said, if you raise your child by your past, you will be doomed to produce the same product that you don't like. You have to raise her according to how Jesus built her. He built her for some specific things. 
and don't think that it's some sort of mistake, but it is not. You have got to raise your child by God's word on their life. I raised Tyler by God's word. And, and, and when you get off, he'll tell you, because he'll say, ah, 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 ah. not this one. He used to tell me all the time, not this one. And I'm just going to thank God that she's going to wrap you all around her finger. And you're going to be that dad that we're going to have to pray that you could at least say stop and now and again. <laughs> you all are a wonderful family. Bless you, grandparents. You're a wonderful family with a wonderful baby and a wonderful son. I bless you in Jesus' name. Now, let me get the, ah, Araya. We didn't put pumpkin on here, though. <laughs> right? <laughs> Because if I was doing this, I would have had the watermark punter in the back. Yes, I would. <laughs> but I love her name. Araya McKinley Purefoy. This, is, this certificate is to certify that Araya McKinley Purefoy, Purefoy was dedicated to the Lord Jesus Christ at the Congregation of the Mighty Ecclesial Embassy on the 17th day of September of the year 2023 of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is it. You get to hold that. Hallelujah. Did we ever give you one of those? You didn't get one, huh? You came too old. <laughs> but did you get baptized? No, when, when you get baptized, we give you one. Uh, fair enough? Okay, you get your own. God bless you. Father, we thank you for this family. We thank you for the mom, the dad, and the children. We ask God that you fulfill all of their purposes, not just the purposes of the young ones, but purposes of the parents and the grandparents as well. And I thank you, Lord, that you can say to the grandparents, it's never too late in God. God is a completer. And as long as we have your breath, we have your will, we have your purpose, but we also have the destiny you ordained for us before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Y'all come on and give God a praise. Rachel. Rachel. I was, I was feeling that. All right. So it's on you all now, right? I got my stuff. Give God a praise for a new member of the congregation of the Mighty, Miss Oriah. Purifoy. We love you, Araya. All right. Um, today is third Sunday, and on third Sundays, we like to take an offering for our chief apostle because she doesn't get a salary. So we're going to go ahead and just go right into that. So we'll if you all right now can just uh, we have the ushers, the ushers are ready, and we're going to go ahead and take our offering for our chief apostle. Did you all enjoy that word today? Come on, you can do better than that. Did you enjoy that word today? All right, we're going to go ahead and allow you all to give, and Diane, you can play something for us. Are you?
thank you, King Jesus. Even this week, the prayers that are on the altar, we thank you, God, for blessings upon blessings. We call it in today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. As we end today's service, if some of you all who heard the message would like to renew your relationship with the Lord or you need to be saved, we have our elders here, Elder Aaron, please stand and you can meet him over in the chapel. Also, if you need to be uh, filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues, you can do that now. You can raise your hand and walk over or walk over after the service. Uh, and also, we do have our welcome team right here in the back. If you want to know more information about the Congregation of the Mighty and how you could become a member, you can see they have their hands back here. They will meet you at our uh, welcome desk. Uh, and so we thank you all for coming today. Go ahead and stand as we are dismissed. Yes, we're going to stand and be dismissed. So we thank you, King Jesus, for today. We thank you for the word that our chief apostle, Lord God, literally that she is causing ourselves to be converted, Lord God, to everything that you made us to be and become before the foundations of the world. We thank you that this word is cellulating in us, God. And we thank you, God, that all that she has, Lord God, even put in our soul that this week we will do the work. So say it with me. This week we will do the work. You are dismissed. Greet someone, tell someone hello, give them a hug. You are dismissed. That's it.